What's up, guys? Welcome to the Walk On Warrior podcast, where we promote and prepare you young student athletes for next level success. My name is Coach Z. And listen, I'm super excited to have my guest on today. Um, well, listen, without further ado, I'll just have him come on and we'll have him talk a little bit about his story and uh, what he's up to right now as a coach. Um, and he's doing big things here out here in San Diego. Uh, coach Chris Krajewski, welcome to the Walk On Warrior podcast. What's going on? Thanks, Coach Z, for the invitation and uh, having me come out and speak on my story and and anything that we can help out with these student athletes to to become and, and play at the next level. That's the biggest factor for me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so let's just dive right into it. Talk a little bit about because um, you you coach multiple sports, and that's what I like the most about you is that. We always talk about young student athletes and how important it is to be a multiple sport athlete, but I think it's also important to get around coaches that are multiple sport coaches uh, because you have a very versed understanding of not only athletics, but the process of going from one sport to the next or dealing with next level coaches in every aspect of that. Um so talk a little bit about um, the, the sports that you coach, the level, of course, that you coach at, um, and uh, kind of how you got involved in all that. Well, I started coaching in 2009. Coaching football is football was always my, my dream. I played, I played it as a student uh, going through the high school level. Even during the youth time, I played it. Um, but then I also played volleyball in high school. And from that point on, when I moved from the youth level into high school, I jumped right into my alumni school that had offered me an opportunity, which was Castle Park High School. And I jumped in during the spring season and coached volleyball under actually my seat. When I was a senior at Castle Park, I played under my uh, a head coach named Aaron Parch. And then I ended up uh, getting the luxury of coaching with him that first year when I came back in 2000 spring of 2010 and then uh started my journey as a football coach for seven years at castle park um i i did a total i think i believe somewhere around 12 13 years of coaching football variety of schools youth football to castle park high to east lake high um bounced bounced out to sarah high school before they became canyon hills and then uh, bumped back down to, uh, or I went, I returned back to Castle Park before I went to Sarah. And then, uh, and then I finished my career off at Bonita Vista High School in 2021 before I retired. Um, but then just coaching all these different sports, I've coached the uh, roller hockey. I, I've coached boys volleyball, girls volleyball. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on a second. Roller hockey in high school? Yes. What's where's what school is that? That's fantastic. That's great. Uh, the, the rink in this, <laughs> the rink at the Sweetwater District is actually on the campus of Castle Park High School, and how that kind of just fell into place was the current East Lake High head football coach, uh, Coach Jose Mendoza, was the head coach, and he we we had such a great re, uh, relationship as coaches and uh, and friends, and he just asked me to help him out. Um, so we did, we did that for three years together. We were actually league champions for, uh, our first year together coaching that, uh, coaching the beautiful sport of roller hockey. And then, uh, that's great, man. <laughs> that's it, was, cool, it was, man. it was a fun and interesting time for sure. Um, and then, uh, kind of over these course of, over this course of time, since I retired coaching high school, like traditional high school football, I became the field hockey head coach at Castle Park High. Uh, in the fall, and then during that time, I opened up my own club business for South Bay, uh, called South Bay Vipers Lacrosse, which I just felt it was a need for the community down here. It, uh, un, I would say, under the eight, the eight freeway, it just needed to get some uh, true, true uh, style of coaching and 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 uh, the development of lacrosse, and it's really developed in the last couple of years, and that's been my 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 uh, unborn child that's blossoming right now. <laughs> that is such a great, I love that, man. I'm definitely going to use that. And um, it's, it's really, we were talking about this, you know, before the podcast got started and how important it is to have um, coaches in your life. You know, there's a lot of young student athletes. And by the way, you know, on the Walk on Warrior podcast, we are as real as it gets. I'm going to tell you like it is. And honestly, you know, we're dealing, I don't know what the percentage is, but we're dealing with a lot of broken homes and a lot of student athletes that come from 
single parent homes growing up with their, you know, their grandparents, whatever. And coaches, our job, most people would think as you come into it is just a coach, you know, you're somebody that, um, you know, maybe on campus, you're working with a kid in a sport, but you're really filling a lot of roles. And I always mention this is, uh, you know, uh, it, it takes a village to raise a young student athlete. Uh, it really does. And you're not necessarily blood related, but you become somebody like a, a mentor, somebody that really is a beneficial person in somebody's life that can really make a huge a huge difference in somebody's lives. And you working with the high school level, um, that's such a formidable time of somebody's life. And um, you know, talk, talk a little bit about that. Talk, talk about mentorship and how important that being at what being a coach um, means to young student athletes and kind of what you've seen as a coach. I think it comes down to uh, caring, you know, showing. <sighs> yeah. Um, sorry. Yeah. No, you're good. <laughs> Love it. I, 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 uh, I think it's, it's all about caring and passion, you know, especially coaching girls, um, these last nine years, it comes down to, uh, showing that you, you truly care about them. And I think that's where my true growth as a coach came came from moving from boys to to girls because uh, once again you know boys they're they're gonna run through a wall you you hype them up they, you you're gonna go um but girls they don't care what you know it's it's all about how much you care and how much you want to develop um even even yesterday after uh, our tough loss to in the CIF championship game, having kids come up to you and give you hugs showing how much you care. Yeah. Um, it's, it's unmatched. Um, that's the biggest thing for me. It's, it's all relationship. It's all relationships and uh, everything that you build to those kids. And when you get those phone calls, when they're 24, 25 years old, and you know, they talk to you about coach all those times that you yelled at us or you challenged us. It's, 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 it's put us in, in the best, uh, position in our lives to be successful so those are always yeah. <clears throat> the biggest the biggest factors for me as a coach and i and i feel like i've done my job yeah well you know we think about when you hear i hear this all the time well i'm doing it for a reason i look at it as i'm doing it as a purpose right because there's really there's a massive difference between a reason and actually being a purpose right you can do it for a reason. You do it for money. You do it whatever. But when you have a purpose behind it, it really doesn't matter, right? There's no number behind it because you know, as a coach, especially at the high school level, it's a thankless, it's a thankless job, right? People don't understand, you know, as a coach, you're not really getting, paid, you're not getting paid much. It doesn't even matter if even if you go through all the way up to the D two level. Like, there's always if. If, you know, you're a parent out there and you're watching this show and you're viewing this, go to go to some websites where coaches are at the Division two, II, Division three, all the way down, even through high school, the openings for jobs and what they're offering. It is crazy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like like in Texas, there's a reason that you can't be <clears throat> you can't be a coach um, unless you're actually a credentialed teacher, because. They don't want to deal with, you know, the hassle of all these different things. But in California, it's a completely different situation. If you're a high school, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're a high school coach, you're more than likely, if you're not a coordinator or something like that, you're probably not getting paid much. And so you, it's, you're really, you're going and doing a labor of love and you're benefiting this world way much, may, way, the way more than going and being a banker and going and doing all these different things because you're really changing a generation of young student athletes. That to me is so powerful, man. And people don't realize that until 25 years later, like you said, you get a phone call and they're like, you know, coach, I just want to let you know, I was thinking about you. You benefited me. You helped me go from here to here, go from A to B. Um, and it's just so, so important. And, um, 
I find it very unique in what you do because you went from working with boys. And I think, you know, like we were coaching the SDN FNL against each other. And obviously you're still working with boys, but you kind of transition more into working with the ladies. And uh, obviously we talk a lot about, you know, the young, young men out there, but let's talk about that, your transition. So, well, I wouldn't say transition, but just going from one, uh, one gender to the next and, um, how you coach them differently and how you mentor them differently. Um, it was, it was a tough, that first year back in 2016, for sure. Um, you know, <laughs> the, the good old trial and errors you have to go through. And, but the, the long story short is you just got to be more compassionate. You got to listen. Um, you got to listen to what they're going through. Um, let them vent at times and just listen to them. And then you guide them to the next to the next resource that that needs to be for them to be successful and that's the biggest factor um you know girls are girls are or it's an emotional level and how and you got to show that passion you got to show that care but they, they will go run through a wall for you when they know they that you care yeah talk about uh talk about because you're because lacrosse you're dealing with a team sport so sometimes we we bypass this we bypass individual sports versus team sports. And that in itself, I think there's a little bit of difference too, right? So if you're dealing with uh, coaching uh, an individual, say individual female versus dealing with a team of, you know, ladies and, you know, not only that, but trying to get them to be super competitive. And um, did you, let me ask you, uh, before we get to that, let me ask you this. So you're, first of all, we're talking about San Diego here for the viewers. They're not, uh, you know, familiar with the show. Um, we're talking about um, Sweetwater District, just south of San Diego proper. Um, and uh, real quick, go into kind of the, let's talk about um, that area. Let's talk about that area. And then we can talk a little bit more about, you know, you coaching there. Because you're, you're currently, what school yet? Castle Park, right? Yes, I'm at Castle Park High. Castle Park. So you're talking about public school, a big public school area. Um, talk about that area and how it, yeah, just talk about that area in Chula Vista. Chula Vista has a big de uh, demographic. It's it's actually, I think it's one of the biggest cities. A lot of people are trying to move down here. Um, but in all in all, what's crazy is that there's, you know, 13 high schools and in, in just in this one giant city of, of, Chula Vista. Um, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. There's two, there's like three of them that are in the South, you know, San Diego area, which is national city of Sweetwater high. And then you got San Ysidro and Southwest down in the South and Mar Vista down in the South San Diego area of Imperial beach and you know, the bottom part. But uh, in general, you got schools that, that struggle in certain, in certain aspects, like uh, Castle Park is a title one school, a lot of diverse families, um, families that are single parent homes, parent you know maybe guardianship type of style uh or, and then you got the east side of Chula Vista which you have the whole backing ground uh background of of the support system from the family lines uh and it it really varies and what's amazing about the situation is you just go right down the road and you might have a bigger support system of parents at one school site than you do at, at another one so it, I think as a coach you have to understand your community and the area that you're coaching at and that's the way for you to be successful at those school sites. I, like I tell a lot of my young assistants when they become, when they have aspirations of becoming head coaches, I said, everything I do here at Castle Park High School is not going to translate to somewhere else. It translates to this school, but there is a core values of what I do that will translate anywhere you, anywhere I go or anywhere, if you want to adopt those, those, those core values to your system and to your program. But you have to have the understanding of the community and what you're dealing with daily. Yeah. Well, and, and also talk about some of those areas aren't exactly the, we'll just say the easiest. <laughs> no, <laughs> it, it, yeah. it's not. And I deal with it at, at Castle Park all the time, like nine years as a head coach. And I could literally count off in nine years of how many parents have been at my parent meeting. And it's 30. It's about 30 to 40 people that in, and I'm saying 30 to 40 people in nine years, not 30 to 40 people in one 
parent meetings uh, setting. <laughs> yeah. So that tells you right there that the the support system of parents are just not it's not always there. But the core value, the core parents I got are always my my anchor ones that that I that we cherish and we take care of all the time in in my program. Yeah. And so you also with your lacrosse, with your um, with your business and with the travel team that you work with, um, you guys, let's think of it like this. Uh, so let, let's hold on. Well, we'll I'm sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself right here. But um, let's stay on the development of student athletes real quick, because um, we're talking about certain areas, you know, in San Diego and, you know, you building those young student athletes up into the program that you're dealing with. We'll worry about the travel thing here in a second, but um, talk about development of the young student athletes down there. So we've kind of established the fact that, well, first of all, for the viewers at home, give you an idea. San Diego isn't just beaches, palm trees and surfboards. Everybody lives on the coast. Um, We, you know, once you start getting off the coastline, then you start getting into the real of the real, right? Inner city, start dealing, like we said, with broken homes, you start dealing with a little bit, you know, the ethnicities, things. I got you now. Ooh, cut out. Are you still on here? Yes, I am. Oh, I got you. There you got me still. Yeah. Sorry, I don't know. Yeah, I got you. So let's talk about development. So where you are, you're in a real, you know, the this the area that you are. I don't want to call it inner city, but it's you know it's an area where it's very diverse. And uh, like we just mentioned, but talk about development. So when a young student athlete comes into your program, whether it's high school or comes to your travel team, talk about the development from uh, how how young do you have them? Freshman, sophomore, all the way up. Yes. Okay. So when they come into your program, let's talk about how you develop these young student athletes from that point they come and see you. Uh, I think it re- before I talk about the way I do it, I, I think the biggest factor is in any school you're at or whatever program a coach is coaching, I think you have to have a realistic concept of what of the level of competition that your student athletes are going to be at. And, um, as I've been at Castle Park for a total of 14 years out of my 16 years coaching. And that's at a very, and I'm only 35 years old. So you can already see, I spent the, the majority of my adulthood coaching and mentoring kids. But I think the biggest factor is knowing the background of your student athletes on that campus. And two, knowing what level that they can compete at. Like I e example at Castle Park, we get a sprinkle of those D one kids once in a, once in a while. Um, You've already had one of my former players, Adrian Tolbert, on here, who I felt was a D1 prospect coming out of high school. Now, as he spoke upon his grades, didn't really allow that opportunity for him. And, you know, just the the the, the life cycle that he went through didn't didn't give him that that full opportunity. But he he sees every opportunity and moments that that he wanted to continue his career. Um and it, it really comes and it comes down to making sure the kids grades are up to par. Like Adrian Tober was one. Luke Barku was one out of Castle Park High School. He went to Grossmont for uh, a couple of years and then went to San Diego State, was the interception leader his junior senior year. And now he's playing. He's bouncing. I mean, he's still in the league. He's bouncing around. But yeah. um, even just knowing your talent, knowing what what the tangibles and where you where you foresee the kid. And to where what is your guideline of your school like i know at castle park a lot of our our student athletes are they're they're great kids and they're great athletes and they can compete at a d3 neia level nothing wrong with it in any way um but that's just where our i know where our school's at because we're not getting those upper echelon athletes like we used to when i went to school at castle park high um and there's nothing wrong with the going the junior college route either but just know, don't get stuck there. And that's what I tell kids all the time. Don't get stuck there because you can easily get stuck and get lost in the fold. Uh, that, that for me, is the biggest thing. Get, do your job. It's a job for you if you're going to go to that junior college level. Get in, get out. 
in one and possibly one year. Now, don't get me wrong, the transfer portal has changed the course of the game in major right. ways. So you have to you have to better yourself and make everything from you're competing with every portal Juco type of kid or any kid, anybody that's coming from another another uh, high level school or they're transcending down from one to two, two to three, three to NEIA, whatever, et cetera, et cetera is going on. Just know your whole entire surroundings and work. You have to work harder. This yeah. this time is not easy anymore. Um, yeah. But I and I tell the kids like I have one one girl at, at Castle Park High uh, within our lacrosse program that I had I think is potentially a Division One prospect. There's another one on our on our roster that's a junior that's going to be graduating next year. I think she's a D two kid. Uh, and I've had these straight up conversations, but it's also getting the kids out during the time and putting in the work. Uh, yeah. Some of our some of our kids can't afford to go to camps on the East Coast where these college coaches might be running a camp. Um, so you have to do your due diligence as a coach and get their name out at a certain point. And I know I have a spreadsheet on all my lacrosse boys and girls across the county from Division One to any other. From Division One NEIA, and when I feel that if I think a kid's a Division One kid, I'll put it out, and I know if they if if that bites, well, she's gonna get everything from D two down. It's a domino effect for me. Um, yeah, and I do look at the talent level of the of the player, and I and I critique it, and I know and I know where they can play at. Yeah, here is a great. Uh, that's a great point. But this just something pops up to popped up in my head when we're when I'm hearing you talk and um, student. Now I'm going to say this a certain way, right? Instead of a coach player relationship, I'm talking to you, young student athletes, player to coach relationship. You're talking about a lot of things right there. You're talking about development of the young student athletes. You're talking about organization. But the main thing that really popped up when you were mentioning that is you getting their name out, you as the coach and how you influence, you know, influence uh, whether or not because college coaches come to you for some student athletes that are just coming on you for the first time. It's vitally and I get into this argument all the time with uh, with with other coaches, lower level high school, you know, whatever coach, well, you know, it's, there's always going to be bad co high school coaches out there. So you shouldn't have built, shouldn't build relationship with the coaches or you have bad. Rela I don't know what it is, but I hear this all the time. And I think they are 100% missing the boat. You have to build a relationship as a young student athlete with your coach. I understand there's going to be bad coaches. That's a fact. But with your head coach, you better figure out a way to be that favorite or you better find a way to build a relationship with that coach, whether it's through hard work, get it going to him after practice. What more can I do to get better? Build a relationship with your coach, because when it comes to recruiting, is that's what this whole thing is about, is, you know, when a coach comes to a school, who do they go talk to? They come talk to the head coach. Right. Or if you're on a travel team, what do they do? They come talk to you. Right. So it's vitally important, you young student athletes, to build a relationship with your head coach and your assistant coaches. Some of them, you're not, like I said, you're not going to be able to build a good relationship with them. But everything that you're mentioning right there, you're doing work on your end to obviously build you as a coach and your platform and getting out. And But at the same time, that also trickles down to these young student athletes. And that can make or break whether or not a kid gets a scholarship or a kid goes and moves on. And um, with your experience dealing with these coaches at the next level, because we've been talking about development, um, talk about the importance of a player coach relationship in regards to the next level. Uh, the, the biggest thing it, it comes down to, and I, I tell these kids all the time, the three questions that a college coach will ask is one character two, uh, their family life and three, their grades. That's before we even speak upon any aspect of their playing ability on that field or their skill set. So if the kid's a high character kid, they have high, a high GPA, I can sell them like a like a, an amazing car salesman I, and I can sell them sell them to any college. Um, and it also comes down to their, what, what their ultimate degree plan is, what they want to study in, in school. 
Yeah. I've had many, many kids tell me, oh, I want to study nursing. Well, nursing is one of the biggest degree plans in it, in any four-year university, and it's easy for me to get them out. So if they want to do nursing or they want to, or they're a 4.0 kid, well, you're walking on millions and op- millions of opportunities. So those are those are factors that I've sat down and I've and I've had my conversations with many, many college coaches. But at the same time, when I don't have a kid at Castle Park and they come knocking on our door and they, a lot of a lot of time they come around during January, uh, you know, early January during that Martin Luther King weekend. And if I don't have a kid, I send them out somewhere else. I always will push whatever I know about a kid. So from from any other school site, I will make sure I try to do it. And especially it's kind of led to now the travel team that I've built those relationships with those with those student athletes that we've already sent um, seven kids, I think, and believe in yeah seven kids in about two years already to the four year university circuit to play lacrosse. And that's boys and girls that we've done this with. So um, it's, a, it's a lot of grind and it's a lot of hard work. But, you know, it, it comes down to the kids excellence that they wanted that they're you know, showing in the classroom and on the field. Yeah. Well, talk about the importance of having that relationship, though, like the the player to coach relationship and building a good relationship with you, because like I was mentioning, coach, you could be the final say in what a kid gets as far as uh, opportunity at the next level. Kid may be really good, but the parent or parent, I'm sorry, but the coach, you could be like, well, you know, he's got poor grades just as far as his character, you know, you give your, your two cents on that. Um, I'm not saying you're sabotaging a kid. I'm just saying that with, with young student athletes, a, a coach at the next level wants to know they can trust a kid. They want to know that this kid is going to be all about them, not about all about the program, not about them. And how important the coach, the player coach relationship is for getting opportunities. I think as a high school coach and uh, you know the high school players i think it's transparency and explain to these kids yeah. that this this coach is recruiting you this is their livelihood and if you bomb out well, that's <laughs> cool. you're costing that coach and his his uh his or her coaching position at that school site you know at that university um and two i think don't and i and i'm very transparent on these these student athletes too that don't don't be knocking somebody that's who, who that's coaching at an NAI level that's recruiting you because in two weeks later or three weeks later or a month later there might be a coaching opening and they're coaching division one ball <laughs> um yeah you know uh, there's many many things that have occurred and I've seen it from you know colleagues that I've worked with happen in the on the football side and I I've also seen it on the lacrosse side that there was a, a coach he was the head coach at at a division two school. And now he's the offensive coordinator at a division one school. And he recruited what my best players uh, sister back then. And now he's looking at her sister, her younger sister now. So what, again, it's all relationships you build and don't doubt a coach where they're at, you know, l- listen to them and always keep those connections. And, you know, the other biggest factor I tell kids is keep those connections. Cause you never know when those connections you're, you're going to need them. Um, so it's always being, it's plain and simple, being kind and respectful to every, to every, uh, thing that's coming your way that, 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 that's the ultimate situation. And just know too, every decision you make is also a repercussion to the ne- the persons, the people that are coming behind you. Um, I e example, like, you know, if you go to a, a four year university and you drop out one to two years after, and that coach is upset just spent invested all this this university invested all this money and now they're not going to recruit where you came from at a high at the high school because you faltered out so respect the people behind you too in this in this journey that you're going as a, as a student athlete at the next level thank you i've had i've had multiple podcasts <clears throat> and i've talked with coaches and that's the one thing i really wanted to get out um, we got a lot of great information. Go like, share, subscribe on the sh- on the channel. Walk dash on Warrior. Little plug, real quick on YouTube. But that is huge. You young student athletes don't understand that not only can it affect you if you have a bad relationship with your coach, but it can affect everybody else. 
So if you've got a younger sibling or somebody that's involved in this whole process, guess what? If you burn a bridge, you go somewhere, you burn a bridge, they ain't coming back to deal with that school, whether your school is a good school or not, man. And it, it takes a lot to get a coach to come back. Coaches have short-term memories. They're like FBI agents. They're going to try to dig into everything because it is their livelihood. And um, I get it. Some coaches will move on after a year. You go to that school, you're trying to recruit, or I'm sorry, you're trying to go to a school that specifically, you know, you want to go for the school, not the coach. That's another, we've talked about that a thousand times, but it's, it's such an important thing to what, what you really brought up. And that's, that's key, man. And, um, you know, young student athletes just need to be prepared just enough and to be developed just enough to where you have those basic skills. It comes back to, listen, coach, it comes back to being humble, being honest, and just trying your best to be a good person, however you define that. If you don't know what that is, go to Coach Chris. He's going to tell you. He's going to help you with that. You just cannot be a kid too long. It's okay to be a kid, but you can't be a kid too long because, like in my course, shout out to my course here in the next month or so coming out, uh, your first impressions are important too, right? And Coach Chris is going to explain to you, you know, when a coach comes in and recruit you or some of your buddies, first impressions, doing the right thing. Sorry, I just went off on a tangent right there. But I get kind of fired up over that kind of stuff because it's just common, it's just basic things that young student athletes don't understand. Coach, we had a kid one time uh, uh, two years ago at Grossmont, I'm not going to name names, but we had a, a – we had some coaches come in that were heavy hitters, you know, big name Pac-12 Mountain West schools, and they were asking for a specific player. Big Samoan kid, defensive tackle, three tech, one tech type. This dude walks in, no shirt on, all comes in, no shirt on, barely wearing anything. And you really think, I'm like, dude, do you really, <laughs> like, you really think that this coach is going to invest the time? and money to put you in a situation to, to come be a part of their program. They're not going to do that. You're crazy. So it's like, you know, just basic, you know, common, uh, you know, common things like that. And we can talk about that later, but kind of moving forward. Sometimes I go off on tangents in these podcasts, dude, but you know, that's, it is what it is, but let's talk about exposure. Now, now a kid has a good relationship with you coach um, or however the relationship is. Now you're kind of moving into that sophomore, junior, um, and senior years. Um, now coaches are coming around. <clears throat> talk about um, talk about exposure. Talk about you, coach, um, how you can put a kid in position to get more exposure as well as a young student athlete kind of doing their due diligence to go out and get recruited and get, get some exposure. I, I think the biggest thing is um, don't waste, as student athletes, don't waste to – rack up offers that's the that's the worst situation um i think what you need to do is and like i tell all my student athletes look at a map tell me where you foresee yourself not what your family wants not what because they're not going to be living there for four to five years it's where you see yourself living for four to five years while you're getting that degree um because let's not waste my time. Let's not waste the college coaches' time that if you have zero desire to go to the East Coast and go to New York or or whatnot, why why should we even open up that channel of communication for that student athlete when you don't foresee yourself there? So I think the biggest thing is being transparent with yourself, with your co your high school coach. And also the the biggest the other factor is whatever colleges that have communicated with you, you need to be transparent with them and in, in straight up communication. I'm sorry, coach. I just don't see myself going to school here or in this state. And I really do appreciate you con uh, reaching out to me and offering me, a, you know, a possible roster spot or, you know, or scholarship, depending on whatever level it is. But it it's communication. It's the simple things. It's the little tangibles that's going to continue to lead you to being a proper adult later. Um, the lack of communication is now, once again, it comes down to a domino effect that now, well, why do I need to reach out to your high school coach to, to then reach out back out to you? 
that's or your travel coach the same thing um i think those are big factors too and then two i in regards to like travel team stuff there's a lot of travel team coaches that say it's d1 or bust and i disagree with that i think it's any opportunity that provides that student athlete to minimize their cost to go to school um every opportunity available should be looked at um and that's the biggest thing that i do for my travel team in regards to my high school team i speak upon the kids where i think they really are at and i do have the conversations with their parents um but yeah i think it's it's transparency the biggest thing is transparency yeah well i think the word that comes to mind when when we're talking about this kind of thing and i won't go off on a tangent on this but is right fit right quote fit because coming from the football side of things Everybody wants to be D1. I get it. Okay, everybody wants to be D1. I'm a three, four, and a five-star guy, but I, everybody wants to go Division One. Now, here's your problem. You don't know what that even means. Once you get on that campus, there's no such thing as stars. Nobody cares about your high school. Nobody cares about all that. You have to reinvent yourself. So when a kid um, decides, hey, I'm going to go do that, a lot of times it's not the right fit. All right? You want to go and play beyond this? I mean, ultimately, as coaches, we we want all of our athletes to go and play beyond high school for the most part, right? We want them to keep pursuing this, and especially if they give you money and it gets you in a position to go get your four-year degree and all that kind of good stuff. But it has to be the right fit. I'll never tell a kid no to not take a preferred walk-on or go be a walk-on because I was a walk-on. Um, but I will tell you the real reality of it. If you're going to go and you're going to go – be number eight, nine, or 10 as a running back at USC as a walk-on with no money. And you're going to hold pads the whole time. You're going to be mad and depressed about it. And then you're going to come home. It's a fact. I don't know the numbers. They definitely don't take numbers on that because the numbers are probably super high. Right. Um, but it's all about right fit. So instead of going and doing that, why don't you go to a division two or a D three that's probably going to give you three quarters of your, your tuition or they're going to give you a good package, a good chunk, especially for lacrosse. I'm not sure kind of how the um, the numbers pan out, but it all comes down to just overall numbers in the program. Um, and who knows, you could be going somewhere on the East Coast that could be a great place, could be beautiful, could be a great place to get a degree, good you know development, smaller town, however you want to put it. You got to look into those things because it's all about right fit. Um and uh, kids kind of look beyond that, right? So we think, oh, you know, my mom wants me to, or my dad wants me to go play here, wants me to go play there. And, and you know, ego kind of gets in the way too. You know, you have uh, – your parents want you to go somewhere because it has something to do with, you know, the country club attitude, country club mindset, whatever, how you want to put it. Um, they just don't want your – I want to tell their buddies, hey, my kid goes to wherever versus goes to another school. So um, but it's just it's all about right fit. And um, talk a little bit about um, let's talk about X's and O's when it comes to getting exposure. And I always mention this. I always talk about emails. I always talk about going to camps. I always talk about your highlight film. Um, I'll always talk about social media. Those are four things in my course that we're going to definitely break down in detail and how to position yourself, what ha what to have in there and what not to have in there, because coaches only have so much time to deal with, you know, the recruitment. Because there are some young student athletes who start getting a lot of recruitment. Part of it is because kids don't understand you have to be a businessman or businesswoman as well. You can't look at it as, well, I'm just going to throw something out there and hope, hope that it sticks at the wall. So talk a little bit about that. Talk about um, a little bit more the emails, the how you deal with these young student athletes in getting more exposure. Uh, so for me, like, when I, I example, the, the, the student athlete I have at Castle Park High, uh, she's a sophomore. Of course, Division One schools can't speak to her. So it's more me advocating for her on her behalf. Um, yeah. But also at the same time, She's got it. The way she has got to advocate for herself is the social media aspect. And I've seen a lot of athletes do this where they have their personal one and then they create like an athlete page and they don't really put content on, on the athlete page. But in yeah. the end, I think what student athletes need to hear in this regard uh, is don't create two different pages because you have 
people that sit in those athletic office all day long to stock your social media and to literally, if they're, if you're a recruit on their team, they're going to find your lacrosse, your lacrosse page or your football page or any other sport that you, you, you play, they're going to find your sports page and they will find their, your personal page too. Um, that is their position in that athletic office. Social media is a big factor. And if you post anything, and I mean, anything that will, put them in in a, in a bad situation they're going to they're going to pull that offer right away i had a student athlete in the past that posted something she had they had an offer and it went right away i get a text while well, i'm at a I'm, a I'm at the san diego state lacrosse game i get a text message from the coach coach i'm sorry but i'm pulling the offer from this individual because of them smoking yes little yeah. factors um a great friend of mine, he, he's playing down professional uh, baseball down in Mexico. And this is this can tell you how old I am, besides my me telling my age earlier. But yes. he was he he was drafted right out of high school at Castle Park High um, in, in 20, uh, 2006. But he had posted some pictures of a, uh, of us all partying on MySpace and he got drafted about 15 rounds later than what he was projected so all those all those factors of which you post on social media i I, and this is the biggest factor i always tell student athletes and this is one thing that i've noticed with people is they don't read articles they read headlines so what is your headline that you want to write so when you make that instagram post that that caption that you post to catch people's eye well what's the headline that you want want seen on that post so i think you always need to think in context of what am i posting what's the headline going to be how many how much is it going to raise alarms in regards to positive and and negative because every every decision we make there's always going to be a positive and, and and a negative um so those are the big things on social media for me and then emailing you know emailing coaches do it at the right time you know don't be bombarding them you know they're if you're emailing them during the, during their season, it's going to be a little tough for them because they're grinding. They're they're trying to take care of their college season, so you know just know the timelines when it's when it's correct to to email them. And especially now, there's so much stuff on social media now that you can easily know when the blackout dates are when you when you can or or you cannot contact them. Uh, but always feel if you if you know you're interested in a school, fill out their their student questionnaire. Their athletic questionnaire it's always there it's, it's on everything it might be on their inside athletics it might be on their individual sports page you just have to find it on their website uh but that's the biggest thing get in their database get in their database watch your social media what you post know what type of headlines you are and the other thing i mean i want to kind of back backpedal back on what you said earlier yeah. about kids knowing their talent level um when you are probably one of the best players on your team you're the you're the shark in a small in a small pond but when you go to the bigger level the next level you're in an equal level at this point and you need to prove yourself day in and day out and you need to challenge yourself day in and day out uh especially because a couple years after you're there college coaches are going to start recruiting behind you they're going to bring the next person in because when you're you're gone in two years that person's going to replace but if you start letting that emotion level and Oh, they're recruiting to replace me. You start having that mindset, that weak mindset. I call it mental being a mental midget. Then, then you're uh, then you're not going to be there anymore, and that person's going to replace you. And you're going to be riding the pine on the bench. Yeah. Well, they're coaching college. They're not coaching high school, so they're bringing guys in to be at a high school or at a college level. Um, and it's a projection, right? We're trying to put you on a timeline to project what you're going to be from the moment you step on campus to the moment you leave our program. And if we don't feel like you're going to come in and you're going to check all these boxes or at least check seven to eight out of ten, and we can at least help you with the other two boxes, you know, because coaches coaches aren't, you know, these monsters that you think they are. However, they have requirements. So when you get to a certain point, because they want to develop you in their system and how they coach whether it's their offense or however, you you know, their personality, however it is. And if you don't develop within a certain amount of time here, I'm going to give you a little secret, you young student athletes. 
after every single year, they have meetings with you. Your individual coaches will have meetings with you. They call them exit meetings. They will decide whether they're going to keep you or not keep you. This four-year college scholarship is not four years guaranteed. Kids don't understand that. They will cut you. They will let you loose. Now that we've got the portal, now we've got NIL and all this crazy stuff that's going on, it's a mix and match at times. So you could have 30 to 40 guys leave. It's possible. Maybe not that many, but it's possible. And so, you know, if you really want an opportunity, you can get it. Now, it all comes down to what Coach Chris was talking about, about, you know, you being realistic about your talent and your ability and all that kind of stuff. And then also right fit. But once you get onto that campus, they're they're recruiting you to be in college, not in high school, in college. So things you can get away with, whether it's on or off the field in high school, it's chances are you're not going to get away with that at that next level. And you have to reinvent yourself. I talk about that all the time. Reinvent yourself. And even in high school, whether you're a freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, you're constantly reinventing yourself from junior college to, or I'm sorry, from um, uh, J, junior vars or yeah, JV to senior in high school. There's a lot of things that are going on when you're a young student athlete, and it's all about reinventing yourself. But taking those little battles, winning them every single time, and getting momentum. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Um, but uh, let's let's talk. We'll, we'll land the plane here. Um, but let's talk about um, let's talk about your travel teams. I don't think we talk enough about travel. Um, it's kind of a you're you're almost specializing, right? I mean, to a certain degree, you're you're playing year round, um, and I think this is really key that we talk about something like this. And um, you give me your and everybody and the viewers watching your thoughts on because there's many teams or many sports. Sorry, this is for some reason I can't get my my thoughts together. But um, talking about year-round players in these travel teams and how that can benefit you um, versus somebody playing multiple sports. Is that the right way to put it? I think I think so. Um, <laughs> so I sit yeah. on both I sit on both fences in this regard um, yeah. as me, as one host or you know owning a travel team and coaching it and I literally coach the sport probably nine out of the 12 months a, a year uh you know and i just coach field hockey for three you know here's a laughing part is people ask me all the time well how do you not know the field hockey rules you've already been coaching them for one or two years i'm like because i don't spend a lot of time coaching field hockey i spend the majority of my time coaching lacrosse yeah. um but in general i think the biggest thing is like i told the girls last you know last night after or yesterday afternoon after our cif championship game is is this a lot of my girls are field hockey players that were a group that went to lacrosse. Uh, a lot of them were wrestlers, like 11 out of our 12 wrestlers on our campus were all played lacrosse. And of course, my defensive coordinator is, a, is the girls wrestling coach at Castle Park. But um, in general, it's all about giving them the best high school experience. It, they only live high school one time in their life. So enjoy the moment. But as I know, and multiple college coaches I've spoken to, they like multiple sport athletes. Every sport works hand in hand as, you know, before I, before I start talking to the travel side of it, but every year in the, in the fall, the winter, while I'm going into lacrosse season, actually mainly the winter, I'm looking at basketball players. I'm looking at soccer players. I'm at their games. I'm recruiting them. I am literally like treating this like a college atmosphere. And some, some of these kids are like, what's going on here that, I'm getting recruited by another our another high school coach on our campus to go play his sport. And they're like in shock. But I've watched <laughs> their games and I send them, you know, I send them in individual individualized emails with copying their uh, you know, the the soccer coach, or i.e., you know, the, our our soccer coach with Coach Pinero. He's on those emails. Uh, same thing on the basketball side of it with Coach Lida. So everything those kids are hearing and I look at their tangibles, what skills that they can bring to the, to the lacrosse field. Uh, but when you're a multiple sport athlete, it makes you better. It makes you an overall player. Uh, I, um, example is my best player on my roster. She plays uh, flag football in the fall. She plays field hockey. She, in the winter, she plays soccer and basketball. So everything that she learned in basketball season, everything she learned in field hockey has helped her even be a better athlete this season as a lacrosse player. Last year, she scored 70 goals. This year, she's uh, 
at 103. So she's going to be over 200 goals in her in her career before her junior year is even over. And most kids in high school don't score 200 goals uh, ever. Um, but on the travel side of it, you know, the reason I designed a travel team was because of the environment, the community that was in dire need to, to compete. Um, but I'm more than happy to work with any student athlete that wants to come out. If they just want to be a practice only player, they just want to develop their skill set. And we're not here running this where it's seven days a week. We do two days a week. It's on the weekends and that, and it's in the early morning. Um, it doesn't impede on the kids other sport, their high school sport in any capacity. Yeah. Here and there, they might have a Saturday game, Saturday wrestling tournament, whatever. They might have something going on and they, they let us know. They go, Hey coach, I'm sorry. We have, I have this, this obligation for my sport. Cool. No worries. No big deal. We understand what happens, but it's just providing the kids an opportunity to get better and develop their skill sets. So now that they are looking to, if they have the aspirations to play at the college level, that, their development's there and two they're developing for their high school season. And that's what our goal is. in in within my travel team, it's not here collecting the money and making and making these kids and parents pay so much money to, to just coach. And this is not my livelihood. Like I've told every single parent I've, I've dealt with on my travel team that or new parents that new prospect parents, I'm not here for the money. I'm here to develop a kid. And we, some parents have told me, coach, you're, are you, is there opening ro- is there o- open roster spots for my son or daughter? And I said, there's always roster spots. And they look and I can I can hear it in their voice where their head turns or pops back. And they're like, what do you mean? There, there's there's not a you don't cut anybody. I said, I don't cut anybody because any kid that truly wants to work and grind, I am happy to work with. And my staff is happy to work with because that that fire and that eager that they want to get better is the ammunition of what I want to work with a student athlete, not that one that just wants to be there. Yeah. Well, you young student athletes that are watching this as well as parents, it's always key. Listen, we're dealing with coach Chris who does work with a lot of, you know, the high school level student athletes, but he's got a next level mentality. And that's, I mean, really what you are going to see at the next level Um, because it's all about high school coaches at the senior that, you know, towards the end of a kid's life, you need to be training yourself as a coach, almost as if you are that collegiate coach. That's why I say, you know, if you're a, you know, D2, D3, NAIA school or whatever, go hire some of these high school coaches. You're already dealing with them. They already know the process of developing young student athletes. And for me personally, it's way tougher dealing with, you know, a 12, 13, 14, <laughs> especially when it's all year round, you're dealing with travel teams and organization and building all this. Um, and uh, so, with you young student athletes as well as parents, it's important that you ask questions and see if it's right for you too. Because sometimes, you know, Coach Chris, you might say, well, you know, yeah, I got this, uh, uh, I got travel teams, whatever, but go be a kid. Like you're just saying, go enjoy your time at Grossmont. What we'll typically do is, is when it comes to that senior year, when you're in your spring, I would tell them like, dude, the kids ask me all the time. Well, coach, you know, I'm not sure. I'm thinking we're going to do, do this. Go do it. Go do it. Go have fun. Go finish your senior year. You only get one high school experience. Go enjoy it. You're not going to all of a sudden not be good within (laughs) a certain amount of time. Enjoy yourself while you're in high school. But I always say, listen, all gas, no breaks, because if if you want to be dedicated and, and do multiple sports or specialize in a sport, you need to put as much time and effort into it because then if not, then you get in trouble and do all these stupid things. The kids drives me crazy. Um, but uh, last question. Listen, I want to ask you a personal question. What is your favorite thing about being a coach? Mentorship. Um, that's the biggest thing for me. Um, and the, and just the player, the, the player to coach relationships, um, you know, just recently was my birthday a couple of weeks ago. Um, and we beat, we beat it. We won our last game in our league play and to get a text message from a girl that I coached that she graduated in 2018 uh, to say happy birthday to the best coach that she ever had. Always warms my heart. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's just relationships with, with, with anybody or well, anybody that you come across and, and player wise, like, you know, I just, I just spoke to Adrian Tolbert the other day. 
he's back yeah. in town um, from his his time uh, in Italy. For him to wish me good luck in the CIF championship. Same thing with uh, Malik Steen, who graduated from Castle Park, played at yep. Grossmont, and now he's playing down in Mexico professionally. Wise for for all these kids just to reach out to me. Yeah, it shows. Um, yeah. Even though, uh, even though we lost yesterday, you know, everybody said, uh, "Coach, you you took him there." So um, it shows I'm doing things right. Yeah, no, it's fantastic, man, and um, that's the passion and pride that you have in what you do and um, what you expect out of a young student athlete. You also expect that of yourself too. Um, I know I said that was the last question, but one more final question: If you could do it again. Again, and you choose whether um, if you could do it again as a player, what would you do? Or or if you could go back as a coach when you first started, if you could do it again and speak to yourself at the beginning to maybe do something differently. What would you do? Uh, I, I, I think I would listen a little bit more. And, you know, the, the biggest thing is being humble when you're a young coach. Um, I, I do know that I was young, tough on kids. I was young and tough on colleagues I worked with. There's a lot of past history I've done. Um, you know, just, just being humble enough to accept how do you want to change and how do you perceive your career and how do you perceive people looking at you? Um, and, um, I think the other factor is critique yourself as a coach every year and look at the positives, look at the negatives and how can you adjust those negatives to, to become better. Um, and always be accepting to learn. Like I will sit here and say this to, to the nearest end. I was a terrible, and I mean, terrible lacrosse coach my first f four years. I don't know <laughs> how we got to winning a potential shot to win, to winning league my fourth year. And, uh, we finished 10 and eight, but you know what? The, 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 the biggest thing was humbling myself and when I got a call to go coach in Baltimore um, and I thought it was just a club team asking for my kids and I'm like, they can't afford it. Um, then they emailed me again and I straight up told them, I said, no disrespect to my school site, no disrespect to my community, but I can't sit here and coach this. I don't know if I'm even good enough to, to do this. And they said, coach, we we googled you we found we googled championship team caliber teams and your name came up and we want you here i said okay but i'm voicing my concerns that this is little baby lacrosse and you're putting me in the powerhouse of lacrosse and on the east coast and hum that was a very humbling moment and you know it, it was a big learning experience for me out there and from that time on everything i do now is based off of that moment and how i coach it is East Coast style lacrosse, like I tell college coaches all the time, I said there's a difference of East Coast lacrosse and, and West Coast lacrosse. But um, that was a humbling experience. And and two, last year watching the national championship game with Northwestern and Boston College, and just to see what Northwestern was doing on that game taught me a lot of stuff. And I implemented it. And actually, this is a your be be this is public information now, but. I've already clipped plays on our huddle account that I'm sending to Northwestern as a clinical tape that thank you for what she, what that coach did during that game and the style of play that they played that we incorporated it on my travel team. We've incorporated, incorporated at Castle Park high. And that's the biggest factor and the biggest reason why Castle Park was in the CIF championship this year. And the same thing with my defense coordinator. He got some, he got some clinical notes from Ohio state. Ohio State's defensive coordinator and he's he's making his uh clinical or he's clipping his clips and we're sending it to the Ohio State coach and saying thank you again so you know it, it comes down humbleness know exactly what your value is but always be humble about it and don't try to push the doors open the doors open for a reason but keep being professional about it don't pursue don't do things that's going to burn a bridge later as a young coach um, Love it, yeah, it's good stuff. Hey, uh, shout out Northwestern's lacrosse team. Listen, uh, also shout out Coach Mike Moore. 
Mindset Mike, he actually lives here in San Diego, does mindset training. He works, I believe, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure he works with uh, Northwestern. So, uh, small world, man. But uh, listen, um, I am so excited for you and what you've got going on and your future and building young men as well as young women. And um, yeah, you just got a great future, coach. And I really appreciate you for coming on the show. Um, your honesty, integrity, and it's it's valued so much, man. And um, is there anything you wanted to plug, your Twitter, uh, social media, anything like that? Uh, more than happy to f- – you guys, uh, anybody can follow follow me on my Instagram at Coach Krajewski. Um, that, that would be perfect. And any student athletes, I'm more than happy to work with them. Uh, they can send tape to me and, I, you know, be, work with them on that. Uh, the biggest thing I just do want to leave is – Make sure on student athletes tapes on their huddle, make sure in the first 30 seconds you got eye opening because that's all you're going to catch a college coach. They only want to see the first 30 seconds. They don't care about a three minute video. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They yeah. they want 30 seconds pop, pop, pop. And that's it. And then that the, that's all they want to see. Um, the other thing I, I would say is as a coach, if you're a young coach out there, uh, Accept your mix, your mistakes and don't be scared to tell your athletes that you've made mistakes on that field. They will value more you more of you telling the truth than you lying to them because they will student athletes. They see they see through the lines and they see through you when you're when you are uh, BSing them. So really stay stick to the guns. And if you make a mistake on that field, tell them, you know, I made that's my mistake. Like even yesterday, we got caught on a, on a bad penalty, and I told the kid, I said, "It's my mistake." Um, just don't, you know, just don't lie to him. Be transparent. That's the biggest thing. Be be transparent. As I'm a old, I'm a young guy in an old school mind and old school soul that's coached for a long time. So, really hope the values of what I told you guys and and anything I've can help you guys in the f- future. Coaching wise, doesn't matter the sport um, or student athletes. I love it. Yeah. And whether you're a lacrosse player or you're a football player, anybody that just needs mentorship coach, Chris has you, uh, has everything that you're going to need. Definitely for sure. And so listen, Hey, I always like to finish the podcast off just like this coach. It's not about me or coach, which way we're at this way. (laughs) I can't do it. We're on this thing. It's not about me and it's not about coach Chris. It's about you young student athletes and your development. We'll see you guys in the next episode.